Want to make sure your bandsaw doesn't cut with the accuracy of a chainsaw? Well, I'm going to show you how. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of DP Shop Talk. Today we're going to be taking a look at bandsaw basics. Now, the bandsaw, if it's not properly tuned, you might as well be using a chainsaw. I mean, if, if your blade is drifting around and your, your uh, cut's not set square, it's really not given the accuracy that it can. So in this video, I want to go over the basic setup of the bandsaw, as well as some uh, tips for use and some safety tips as well. Now, the bandsaw has kind of a special place for me. It was the tool that really got me into woodworking. Uh, back in, in grade 8 shop class, the instructor showed us the bandsaw. It was very similar to this. It was a Delta 14-inch bandsaw and uh, told us what a great tool it was, how versatile it was. And I thought, wow, that's a really cool tool. I want one. So I ended up uh, buying my own and got my own shop started, and that's how I got into woodworking. So, uh, so it kind of has a special place in, in, uh, in my shop. So the bandsaw is a very versatile tool. I use it a lot for, uh, for rough ripping of boards. So if you get roughs on boards and you want to split them into the rough widths to let them uh, acclimate in, in the shop and, and get any twists out of them before you mill them, works really great for that, uh, for resawing and as well for doing all kinds of curve cuts, whether it's in, in thin stock or thick stock. It really is a, a very versatile tool. I mean, you can even do joinery with it, mortise and tenons, dovetails, like it's, it'll do a lot of different operations in, in one single tool. So now we'll get into the basic setup from start to finish, and I'll show you how that works. So before we get into uh, blade installation, I just want to talk a little bit about blade selection. Now, you can get all different widths of blade and uh, also different tooth counts. Now, the tooth count, uh, the, the fewer teeth you have per inch, the coarser the cut it's going to give you, so it's not going to be as smooth, but it will cut more aggressively. So if you're cutting through a lot of thick stock, doing resawing, things like that, then you want a coarser tooth so that it will cut more efficiently and, and get through that, that thick wood. If you're looking for a, a a smooth cut, then you want uh, a higher tooth count, so more teeth per inch, and that will give you a smoother finished surface. Now as far as blade width, uh, it depends on the radius that you want to cut. So if you want to do a lot of kind of scrolling work and tight radiuses, then you want a very narrow blade. If you want something that's going to track a little straighter for doing a lot of ripping and or more gentle curves, then a wider blade is, is best. Now, for me, I usually keep a half inch, three tooth per inch blade installed in my bandsaw. Uh, I find that it, it takes care of most of my ripping and resawing needs, and will also get some, some gentle curves done as well. Uh, I don't generally do a lot of tight curves, so I find that the half inch blade works well. So for the installation, you want to make sure that all your guides are backed off completely, your throat plate is taken out, and depending on, on the bandsaw model that you have, make sure that the pin or whatever holds the, uh, the table together at, at the, uh, the slot, that's removed as well. And you also want to make sure that your tension is completely backed off the saw so that the wheels are as close together as they can possibly be. Now, I always wear gloves and safety glasses because there's a bit of a spring to bandsaw blades and you don't want to catch one in the eye or get your hands cut up, so that's a, a good safety tip. Now, before you put the, uh, the blade on, I always make sure that the wheels are clean because you'll get uh, sawdust compressed on the wheels over time. So I just take a little piece of 220 grit sandpaper, hold it on the bottom of the wheel, and just rotate it around by hand, and that'll clean off any, uh, any sawdust that's accumulated. So do that both top and bottom, uh, just to make sure that you have clean tires to, uh, to put the blade on. So to start, slip the blade in the slot on the table. Now this particular saw with the uh, rip fence rail is a little bit more of a pain to get that by. So you start by getting it set on the lower wheel first. 
like I say, with, with the spring and the blade, it's a little, a little unruly to, uh, to work with sometimes. Once it's onto the bottom wheel, then get it set onto the top wheel. And just try and center it as much as you can on the tire and make sure that it's going in between the guides. There we go, so the blade is on now. So uh, now we'll uh, talk a little bit about tensioning and tracking. So now that the blade is installed, we want to get it tracked. So what that means is getting it roughly centered in, in the, uh, the wheel so that uh, everything falls in, in the same line. Now what you want to do is add a little bit of tension to the blade just to kind of pull it taut and, and get rid of that spring that's in there. You don't want to crank it all the way up, just enough to, to get a little bit of tension on there. And then start turning it by hand you'll quickly see kind of where the blade falls to. Now you turn the tracking knob on the back of the saw in or out and what that will do is tilt the upper wheel forward or backward to get the uh, the blade sitting where you want. So I'll adjust that back and forth a little until we get it just sitting about in the center of the wheel. Uh, that looks good right there. Now one thing that makes the tracking process easier is if you set the two wheels to be coplanar with each other. And what that means is that both wheels fall exactly in the same vertical line, so one's not out from the other. Now I would highly recommend a book by John White called Care and Repair of Shop Machines. He goes over that in great detail as well as uh, really fine-tuning every component of your bandsaw. I did a complete teardown uh, about three years ago on this saw and uh, took the frame apart, everything, pulleys off, all the bearings, the whole works, and it really made a big difference as far as the vibration uh, that I got from, from the bandsaw, as well as just kind of the accuracy of even the guides. Like everything was just very fine-tuned. So I'd highly recommend that if, if you really want to take your bandsaw to the next level. So now that the blade is tracked, uh, we'll talk a little bit about tension. So now that we have the blade tracked properly, we want to get the blade tensioned. Now there's a lot of different methods that you can use um, from tension gauges to methods with the uh, deflection of the blade. I found the simplest and, and most effective for me is just the general rule of thumb that you go one step higher on the scale than the blade width that you have installed. So in this case I have a half inch blade installed like I mentioned earlier so I would take it up to the three quarter inch setting rather than the half inch and that just makes up for, for kind of the inaccuracies in the scale and you can fine tune that as, uh, as you need to as well if you find there's too much tension or, or not enough. So in this saw, uh, just a simple screw mechanism. So you bring that up to, in this case, the three quarter inch mark, like I said, and that will give you the tension that you need on the blade uh, to keep everything uh, true and, and straight. Now I installed an aftermarket uh, Cobra spring in this saw and that made a big difference too because it's, it's stiffer than the stock spring and will give you that little extra uh, pressure that you need to, to get the right tension. Now one important tip, you want to back the tension off when you're not using the saw. If you keep the tension on over time it will tend to kind of deform the, the frame of the saw, it'll compress the tires on the wheels and, and it'll just uh, kind of make things wear out quicker than they should. Now you want to make sure that you remember to put the tension back on before you turn the saw on, otherwise it's just a bad scene. So now that the tracking and the tension is set, you want to turn your attention to the guides for the blade. Now, uh, before I, I get into the guides, what you want to do is just just give the blade, or sorry, the uh, wheel another turn. Just make sure that now that the full amount of tension is on, that the blade is still tracking where you set it originally. So in this case, it's it's good to go. So we're we're ready to uh, to get the guide set up. 
So first we'll look at the upper set of guides. Now it's made up of a thrust bearing at the back which turns um, so when when you push the wood into the blade and push it backwards that thrust bearing will give support at the back so that it doesn't push in too far. And then there's also a pair of side guides that keep the blade from from deflecting to either side as, as you're going and, and turning through the cut. So the first thing I like to set up is the thrust bearing on the back. <clears throat> Now to do that, uh, a business card works well just for the uh, the thickness that you're looking for to get that that distance right. So with this saw, there's a, a screw mechanism that will advance or retract the uh, the thrust bearing. So I'll just bring it up till it's just touching the card in the back, and then tighten down the locking knob. So once that's set, uh, the side guides. Or what you need to set next. So in this case, I have cool blocks installed. They're a, a graphite um, impregnated resin material, so they really reduce the friction uh, on the blade as opposed to steel guides. So with the cool blocks, I like to bring them up so that they're actually touching the blade, not clamping it, but just touching it, uh, so that it gives you kind of the maximum support. So in this case. I like to do it one at a time, so I'll bring up one side so it's just touching, and then tighten down the locking screw, and then bring the other one up so it's just touching, and like I say, not clamping, just touching, and then lock down that screw as well. Now if your saw happens to have steel guides in it, which are the same thing, they're just basically chunks of steel rather than, than the cool blocks, uh, use a, a piece of paper, just like writing paper in between the blade and the guide to give you the proper space in there. Uh, but I would really recommend the cool blocks for the price. Uh, they, they really improve the performance of the saw. So to set up the lower guides, it's very similar to the setup for the uppers. Uh, it's a little bit more confined to get into the space under the table, but a uh, very similar setup. Now one difference that you'll see on a lot of saws is the right guide block on the side. Uh, comes up at a 45 degree angle rather than straight on at 90 uh, so the block is is cut to that angle as well so again slip the uh, the business card in behind or you can use a set of feeler gauges if you have those in your shop a business card is a quick and easy thing to to grab bring that bearing up so it's just just the thickness of the business card away and dial that in and uh, the same procedure for the guide block. So you want to push that against the blade on one side, lock that in. Same thing from the back, you have to kind of get your hand up underneath the table, push that block in, and tighten that down. Now one thing I wanted to mention as well about the guide blocks is the distance front and back. You want the gut, the front edge of, of the uh, the guide block to be just behind the gullets and the teeth, so just those recesses in between each tooth, so that when the blade is is pushed back, when when you start to cut, you don't want those teeth to contact the uh, the face of the guide block. You want them to be clear of it. Now, you want it as far forward as possible to give you the best blade support, but far enough back. That, uh, that it doesn't make contact with it. Otherwise, it's, it's going to chew up your, uh, your guide blocks as you cut. So now that uh, the guides are all set, I've put the throat plate and, and the blade guard and the table pin back in so that everything's kind of reassembled again. And then just as a double check, I like to just rotate the blade by hand and just make sure that it's not uh, binding on any of the guides or anything after those have been set. So everything looks good here. So at this point, I like to close it up, and we'll plug it in. Now everything I've done to this point, the saw has been unplugged. It's very important that you don't have any power going to it uh, when you're doing any of those procedures. So we'll plug it in and turn it on. So everything's running well, and uh, nothing is, is binding, just like when we uh, did, did the test uh, rolling it by hand. And you just want to take a quick look, make sure everything's still in the same position uh, to your, your thrust bearings in the back, and in this case it is, everything is, has stayed just where we put it. 
So then you need to check the square to the blade. And again, we'll unplug the saw after we had power going to it. So I'll raise the guard up so that we have some clearance there. And just stick the square on the table and check to see if it's sitting square to the blade. So in this case, it's just a little bit off. So you can loosen the knobs below, which will unlock the table. And you can just tune it to be just where you want it. And lock it back in again. So now you know that when, when you're cutting, uh, your cut will be square to the table. And also that, uh, that references the fence as well, which we'll get into next. So if you have a fence for your bandsaw, you need to set it up to account for blade drift. Now blade drift is the natural tendency to cut kind of bias to one side or the other. So to, uh, to set that up and, and find what that angle is that you need to set your fence to, uh, you just take a, a straight board and scribe a line parallel to one edge. It doesn't need to be set at any particular distance, just as long as it's parallel to that edge. Now what you want to do is cut along that line until you get to the point where it's, it's cutting in a straight line and you're not having to do any more course corrections. And then at that point, we'll stop the saw and hold it in place, and that's going to give us uh, the line that we want to, uh, to set our fence to. So part way into the board, you'll you'll start to feel kind of an angle that when you're holding that board at, it's get it's giving you a cut or sorry a, a straight cut along that line, and it's not wandering to one side or the other. So now that we have that line established, you just take a pencil and draw a line on the table, and now that is what we'll set our fence to. So now that we have that line scribed on the table from our test cut, then it's just a matter of setting the fence parallel to that. So in this case, there's a couple bolts on the back here. Just loosen those off a little. And then just align it to the pencil mark. Once it's on there, you can tighten the fence down again. Double check. I like to put just a little bit of tension on to kind of hold it and then lock it down. Now I use the uh, the Craig fence on my bandsaw. Uh, it works really well. It's, it's very accurate. It's got sort of a similar uh, setup to a table saw where it's the front locking rail. Uh, as you can see, it's very easy to, to set it to account for, for blade drift. And you, there's a variety of accessories that'll fit into it as well. If you can get like a resawing block that uh, that you can use if you're doing a lot of resawing, and you can adjust it back and forth as well if if you need to. So once that's set up, then when you push something along the fence, it will follow the line parallel to the edge of the board, just like we had with with the test board. So um, blade drift will vary with each blade. So if you install a new blade or a different blade, different width. Uh, then you should recheck this when, when you set it up because it can vary from blade to blade. So another safety uh, note to, uh, to go over is the height of the guard. Now that is, is fully adjustable, so like I said, if, if you're doing resawing, I mean you can set it up high so you can get a wide board in there, or if you're cutting some thin material, you can set it down low. So a general rule of thumb that I use is, is about a quarter inch to half an inch above uh, the surface of the wood that you're cutting, and, uh, and that also gives you the best blade support. I mean, if, if you're cutting something that's an inch thick and, and you have your guard up five inches in the air, then you're gonna get a lot of blade deflection in that distance, and, uh, and most importantly, it's not safe. Uh, now, when you're cutting, you can kind of feel the feed rate that the saw wants to cut at. 
if you have a more aggressive tooth like this three tooth per inch uh, you can get away with with a faster cut usually if you have a finer blade then you have to slow down a little bit so you can usually feel kind of the the happy medium where the saw wants to cut so it's it's not being overfed and and bogged down and you're not cutting too slow and, and sort of burning the work either uh, so as as you start cutting you, you get a good feel for that and and what the proper speed that you should be uh, be feeding the material through the saw at so now that everything is adjusted properly, uh, I want to go over just kind of some basic cuts as well as some safety tips for the bandsaw. So as you can see, we've got the, uh, the fence adjusted and set up. The bandsaw works really good at, at uh, rip cuts and resawing. Now for anybody that doesn't know what resawing means, it's basically taking a board and putting it on its edge and cutting through the thickness of it. So if you have, say, a one-inch board and you want to split it into two half-inch boards, then you can set up the bandsaw to do that. Uh, obviously, the bigger the bandsaw you have, the wider the board that you can cut. So a lot of times if I'm uh, buying some rough saw and lumber to make some kitchen cabinet doors or any kind of similar project where you have a lot of kind of narrow uh, straight rips of wood, I'll use the band saw rather than the table saw to, to rip it in its rough saw state. So that'll allow any internal stresses in the wood to work itself out. And, uh, and it's a much safer tool to do that with than the table saw just because uh, if it binds on the blade, you're not going to get kickback like the table saw does. So if you have a good fence set up, uh, even just a, a board clamped on the table set to that line that we talked about, that will suffice for a fence as well. You don't need a commercially made uh, fence to, to get a good result. So you can use it for, uh, for straight cuts, obviously. Curved cuts is kind of what the bandsaw excels at. Um, if we're doing any from, from uh, sweeping curves to kind of more intricate patterns. Uh, and again, we talked about blade selection. So you want to select the blade that's appropriate to, uh, to the radius of, of curves that you have in your project. So when you're pushing the wood through the blade and, and doing a curved cut, you want to make sure that you continue to push the wood forward as you curve. If you try and, and stop and turn, it's just going to pinch on the blade and it'll bind and it'll burn and, and it won't work well. So you want to make sure that you're always advancing it forward as you're cutting your curve. Another thing is you can make relief cuts. So if you have a curve around, you can make a series of straight cuts into that curve so that as you cut around the curve, those pieces will fall away and it'll make it easier to, uh, to get around the, the uh, radius that you have. Now, uh, as far as safety goes, uh, you want to make sure that you keep your fingers well away from the blade, obviously, like any power tool. Um, as you've probably seen in butcher shops, they have band saws that are specifically designed for cutting meat. So you put your finger through there, it's not going to skip a beat. It's going to take your finger right off. Uh, Any time that I'm getting close to the blade, whether I'm using the rip fence and doing a narrow rip, or if you have a small off cut that's sort of sitting behind the blade, I always use a push stick to, to flick that out of the way or to get something pushed in, in between the fence and the blade. And obviously, like any tool, safety glasses is, is a, a must. Uh, sometimes if, if the blade breaks in the middle of a cut and, and a piece of it goes flying, you want to make sure that your eyes are well protected as well. So as you can see, a properly tuned bandsaw doesn't take a lot of effort, but it, it gives you some good results. It's a tool that's enjoyable to use and in some cases safer as well. As I mentioned, if you're doing a lot of rip cuts, especially on, on rough sawn lumber, it can be a lot safer than the table saw just because you don't have that potential of kickback. So as you've probably noticed in the video, the bandsaw has changed positions a lot. I use a mobile base on my bandsaw. Uh, makes it really quick and easy to move around the shop if, if you don't have a dedicated uh, place for it. So that's a nice accessory to have as well. So I hope that you found this video helpful and informative. And if you have, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave some comments below. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.